All right, welcome, welcome everybody to Interview Thursday. And today we have a very, very special guest from Florida, Kevin Pryor, who is our Florida Chess Association president. Now, um, Kevin, how are you doing today? Just great. How are you, Matt? Doing fantastic. I uh, just want to double check on the sounds for people who are just now tuning in. Is there any echo going on? Want to make sure. Go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Something. Fox says that he can hear, which is good. Make sure that everything else is good to go. Yes, no, maybe. Sounds good on my phone, so I'll go ahead and leave it at that. And we got a good from Mike Villages. Hey, Mike Villages. Welcome, welcome. I think he's All from right. the Villages, I, I would assume. <laughs> yep. All right, so um, what we have going on today in our segment of Psychology of Competition, um, we actually are going to be talking about more specifically what we are going to be doing for uh, chess in Florida. And uh, go ahead and kick us off first, Kevin, with um, go ahead and talk to us about who you are and what it is you do. All right. Well, um, I'm a newly retired person, which is pretty neat. I retired this year from Johnson & Johnson after working there almost 40 years. But while I was working, I was um, working at trying to develop the Jacksonville Chess Club. And it's interesting. I stumbled into a, to a, a chess tournament. Um, first, I asked the guy, I said, do you think you'd let me play? And he said, sure. I said, what do I need to do? And he says, you just need to become a member of U.S. Chess. And so I told him, I used to be a member back in the 80s because I liked the magazine, um, but I never played in any tournament. And so he says, well, you renew your membership and you can come and play. So I did. And I went to the tournament. It was 12 people there. And I met this young man, William Bowman. Uh, and the person who was running the tournament, his name is Steve Lampkin. And wow. so I met them. They're really nice. And I enjoyed uh, playing, played five rounds um, and actually had two wins in that tournament and walked away with a, a rating of uh, like 1325. Hey, uh, nice. So I'm like, <laughs> I'll be grandmaster in no time. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the funny thing is after that, I never won another game for the next year, no matter where, uh, how many tournaments I played in. So hmm. uh, it took a very long time. But the thing that I ended up doing that day was talking to William about the Jacksonville Chess Club and asking them, asking him, what could I do uh, to join? And he told me that the club no longer existed because one person had passed away. Uh -huh. And I thought that was really odd. And he says, well, no one's doing the work to make it a club anymore. And so I said, well, I've got experience with running clubs. I've been on boards. And so I'd be willing to help you. <clears throat> and the rest is kind of history because from there, I just started um, researching and finding out what it takes for a club to be a club and what it takes to be a 501c3 and um, basically uh, brought the club back from from being dormant to a club where um, within a couple of years we were having tournaments of 100 players mm -hmm. uh, we had actually started a Sunday uh, chess training program we had 130 kids on Sundays with 10 different coaches uh, we took kids to the state championship we actually had one little fella win uh, this last year, the uh, kindergarten championship. So we had another person, another kid who finished second place uh, in the K-5. So um, I guess what we were doing was really working. And um, of course, COVID hit. But yep. while I was doing that, William also said, Kevin, why don't you consider um, running for the board for the Florida Chess Association? And this was in 2015. So I said, okay, well, what do I need to do? And he says, you just need to answer a couple of emails every now and then. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, I can do that. So I ran and actually got elected uh, by the slimmest of margins, one vote. Oof. I had 12. The next person uh, below me had 11 votes. So I was thinking, sure isn't a whole lot of people that are interested in voting in this. Mm -hmm. But uh, 12 votes got me in and... Um, upon being on the board, I wanted to make sure I spent um, some effort in being a part of a board. So I found something simple that I could do to make an impact. And that was <clears throat> to create an orientation because I was new and um, I didn't necessarily know what it took to be a board member. So I wanted to kind of set the path for people that would follow. And then the other thing I did was read the bylaws and do some edits to the fonts and stuff because it was different fonts and just looked a little odd. So 
I stayed with that. And um, the following a couple of years I participated, but then in the, the third year on the board, I took on the project of completely redoing the website and, and rolling us over to a, com to a computerized management system because we weren't renewing people, we weren't notifying them. And so this system would actually take care of that. So I, I led the project to, uh, to do all the configuration, download, sc scrub the data. And now the website that you go to today is a result of that project. And then the following, later that year, I ended up going to the, to the delegates meeting <clears throat> for the US Chess delegates meeting. I was named a delegate, so I thought, if I'm a delegate, I'm supposed to go to the delegates meeting. Um, well, I, I went and I was impressed by how big US Chess is and all the different things that people do. And then I also was amazed because I was looking at some of the people that when I had that magazine back in the 80s and 90s, you know, I, I'm looking at some of the people that I used to see on the magazine, be it, you know, the, 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 the former president, you know, like uh, Mr. Winston and, and, and then there's like Al Lawrence. It's like, these are people that I'd seen in the magazine. So I'm rubbing elbows with these folks, which I thought was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then one other thing happened. I found this book that was called Chess Don. And it was written by a man from Florida whose name is uh, Don Schultz. And he recently passed away. But in reading his book, it was his biography. And in reading that, I came to realize that there are people who are good at playing chess, and then there are people who are good at doing chess. Right. And I realized my strength is really more doing than playing. And so I've really spent more time doing chess than playing chess. And at the end of finishing that book, I really felt that when I coupled that with the experience of going to the national delegates meeting, that maybe I could take on a bigger role with the FCA. And so in talking with the board, I offered myself as um, to be the president and they, they accepted me as the president. And uh, I immediately set off creating strategic initiatives and doing things that were part of normal activity in my prior life, as far as being a senior manager for Johnson & Johnson. Right. So I just spent a lot of effort towards setting uh, a new vision for the FCA and finding out where we hadn't gone that well in the past and maybe trying to pull it together. But, you know, one of the biggest challenges was just to get the board to move from the couple of emails every now and then to um, taking on bigger and bigger roles so that this 13 member board actually functions more like a team. And so that's been a big part of it. But through that, the thing that I pledged to them was that I promised that I will do at least one thing every day for the FCA. And what I also did was I created a journal <laughs> so that I could see that I held myself to that responsibility. And I can tell you, basically, right now, I'm on page 115. And I started this on the day that I became the president. Oh, so wow. now I'm on a page 115. There's about 25 line items on every page. And so when it comes to um, doing things for chess, I'm basically halfway through this uh, this book. But the funny part about that is when I told my wife what I was doing, chronicling all the things I do for chess, she says, you should do that for what you do around here at the house. Because I guarantee <laughs> you, you fill up, <laughs> you wouldn't fill up the one for the house nearly as fast as the one you're filling up for chess. So uh, it was kind of a funny little inside joke mm -hmm. between me and my wife. But the main thing is I really wanted to help the Florida Chess Association become something that I understood it to be um, back at the time when Don Schultz and Frank Guadalupe and some of the other folks were leading. Um, and so I just want to try to help bring us back. And it's, it's been a long road uh, for us to get where we are. I like where we are, but we have a long way to go. Yeah, and definitely it's been difficult this year, obviously, with the COVID. But um, in the year that I've been the secretary, you have been an amazing influence, and I've learned a lot from you as as the president of the FCA. So thank you so much. Um, you really do do a lot for all of us, and I uh, hope you can continue to do that in the future as well. <laughs> well, Ryan, I thank you too because you know you've you've had to put up with me, <laughs> and uh, you've made yourself 
um, very coachable and, and always open to suggestion and always available. So you and, and the majority of the board is that way. And, and that's been one of the things that's happened from the time I initially joined the board to where we are now. We've had about an 80% turnover in board members. Mm -hmm. And in that 80% turnover, each one of them now that comes to the board, um, I basically tried to tell them all the reasons why they probably wouldn't want to be on the board because there's going to be a lot of work involved as opposed to the just answer an email every now and then. Mm -hmm. And so now the people who are joining actually come on to make a difference as opposed to have a seat on the board. They're right. actually active and engaged in bringing change and affecting change for Florida. Yes, absolutely. And I've definitely seen a huge change over the year as well with everyone else. And I think the turnover this year in our elections was pretty low. Um, yeah, we had we had some new we, I mean, we've got three new people on the board, which mm -hmm. is which is really good. And, you know, each one of them, again, is coming with an idea of this is how I'm going to make a difference as opposed to um, not necessarily trying to drive change. You know, I've put in um, with the group for us to hit certain strategic initiatives. Last year, one of them was for us to turn around what was the loss of income and loss of money year over year. Um, and of course, COVID kind of helped because there wasn't much to do and to spend on. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that we pointed out was from a strategic initiative was to add more tournaments. Because when it comes to a state association, the U.S. Chess Federation gives you certain guidelines that they say, you're going to need to do this to be a recognized state affiliate. Um, those things are expected, their requirements. And it's simple things like you have to pay your dues, you have to make sure that you've got some type of communication device like a newsletter or something like that. <clears throat> you need to hold a championship. Um, that's another requirement. And so when it comes to the base things, we always did the base things because we had a tournament every year um, and we even had scholastic tournaments you know, every year. So the thing that we wanted to do for 2020 was to double the slate of tournaments. And so we actually had on the books a women's tournament, which was coming right on the heels of the scholastic tournament, and then a senior tournament. Uh, and so both of those were actually actively being worked on. In fact, the, the girls tournament, the women's tournament was already in place. I mean, you know, you were helping to actually yep. make it happen. And it wasn't until the day before the tournament that the venue pulled the plug on us. Mm -hmm. But that tournament, based upon the work that you and Brian had done, Especially along Brian. with Krista Alton, mm -hmm. who is our women's and representative, Krista, yep. one of the first women on the board in decades, um, we were ready and excited because that was one of the strongest women's field uh, for chess. I mean, we had titled players who were coming. Uh, and so it's a shame that we didn't get to hold that because it was very impressive. And then part of the reason why we were doing that was because, you know, I filled out the request for a grant with US Chess um, to help fund it and, and they accepted our, our offer. So that was great. So, you know, one of the things that we've done differently now is we've tried to be um, more of an of a national uh, group, getting national recognition. Mm -hmm. And we also sub submitted uh, Harvey Lehrman, who is our longtime newsletter editor, for a national award with the Chess Journalists of America. Uh, I looked at the list and the criteria, and um, there was one that was called special recognition. Harvey's been doing this newsletter for 25 years. That's special. That's by yeah, anybody. great dedication right there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we submitted that and he got that award last year. So once again, we got another, you know, nationally recognized feather in our cap. Yep. Um, and so that was another great thing. So we ended up winning a second one as well because um, Steve Vigil had written an article based upon one of our tournaments and he did such a good job that he won an award for that too. So we got national recognition there. We got the sink field money, um, which was nationally recognized. You know, we did a lot of different things um, with, um, with, with the way we do elections and we went to an online election system. 
We also started putting out information where you have the candidates provide a bio or statement to say, this is what I'd like to do if you elect me. And that's an improvement because honestly, in the past, people would just use the same statement over and over again. And if they'd been on the board for 10 years, they'd mm -hmm. say, oh, just run that statement from 10 years ago. And you know, now we, we actually have to say, what have you done for me lately? Because mm -hmm. I think that the people in Florida would want to know the impact of the people that they're electing to the board. Right. And they're, you know, we have to be progressive, always moving forward and improving. And uh, Kevin, you are getting a lot of praise already in the chat here, um, saying that you are very dedicated and that you have started most of Florida Chess for history, which is great. And that's what he likes about people that they uh, make history. And I don't know if you know this person, but CD Perez also says, he found out that you found out that his son started playing and sent him a full training setup with study guides. Couldn't have a better guy as FCA president. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, well, truth be told, that's my nephew. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. But my great nephew, when he told me that he was playing, it's like, oh, well, I do so much with kids. There's no way I couldn't send, I couldn't send Ethan that, uh, that chess set. So mm -hmm. I'm so glad. And, you know, I, I just, I continue to talk chess and promote chess. Um, you know, I'm one of the few that when I go to an event here in Florida, I'm asking people, why, not, why are you not a member of the FCA, you know? And so it's been interesting in listening to the responses because it's taught me that along the, along the way, the FCA kind of dropped the ball as far as that person to person connection. And um, so that was one of the things that I talked to the board about was the importance of us establishing the FCA and establishing membership as far as having some kind of value. Because when I'd ask a person, why are you not a member of the FCA? They'd say, I see no reason to join. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the value proposition became something that was a concern. And so one of the things that I turned to the board and said was, whenever we do something, even if it means hiring floor TDs for our events, we only want to use members of the Florida Chess Association. Right. Because that way people see, well, that was a great way for me to get TD experience. And without that, then you don't get a chance to actually do that because our tournaments are big. We can have a 300 player tournament and short of going to a national event, you're not going to get that kind of experience credit uh, unless you're a member of the Florida Chess Association. So mm -hmm. that was one of the aspects that I looked at to say, we've got to make sure that people know that there's value in being a member. And that's just the beginning of where we need to go with that. Especially, and now we're getting modernized. Uh, lots of stuff is moving online. Uh, we have a lot of new uh, tournaments being hosted online from all over Florida, all over the US. And currently uh, Florida is representing um, so we have Florida players representing Florida in the States Cup. Um, just yesterday, we played against North Carolina and were able to win with a, uh, don't quote me, it was a record of four to, uh, shoot, I messed up, five to 11, I think. It was, it was pretty good. <laughs> so definitely, um, definitely moving forward still. And well, uh, Harvey Lerman here is in proud of the work that you and Brian are doing for pushing the envelope. I mean, you guys our, 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 our tech, you're at the point of the spear on our, on our tech and, you know, events and shows like this, it's really great. The work that you guys are doing. I mean, that's just a fire that you want to throw gasoline on. And right. So I'm a big fan, which is why uh, when I get the email that says you guys are live, I, I jump in, <laughs> you know, I come in as Jack CC one, mm -hmm. but um, I'm always happy to, to jump in there because one of the strategic initiatives that we started or put out there for last year and carried on for this year was to continue to expand our social media footprint, you know, with podcasts and videos, mm -hmm. also supporting podcasts like the Perpetual Chess Podcast. You know, those are great shows that, um, that I really appreciate. So the fact that we can get out there, part of our mandate and charter uh, is to help promote chess. And we've done that by sending money to schools and providing different things. In fact, Thinking about it last year, you know, we had a big, big impact for um, for chess in the in the area or the space of the Florida School for the Deaf and the Blind. <clears throat> um, myself and 
and and my and, and my my partner that I work with um, on Scholastic in Jacksonville, George Foot and I, we run Scholastic tournaments. Mm-hmm. And I got an email from a guy who's a teacher at the Florida School for the Deaf and the Blind, and he said, um, "I'd like to bring some of my kids. What do I need to do?" And I'm like, "Well, they need to be members of U.S. Chess." And he's like, "Well, they don't have a lot of money." He's like, "You know what? They're blind." He's like, yeah. He's like, you have your own Braille boards? He says, yes, we have Braille boards. So don't worry about it. Between George and I, we'll make sure that they get the U.S. chess membership. That's not an issue. Well, they come to the tournament. Three kids show up and they've got the canes and they're touching the floor with the canes and everybody is just silent. And they sit down and they're getting beat you know I mean it's just the kids that are playing them we had to actually have the the helper person to move the board right (laughs) Um, but one of the little kids was pretty doggone good and he ended up in that first tournament drawing a kid all right sighted kid so once again that's another thing where we looked at it and went we've got to see if we can help these guys so we ended up helping them um, and they came back to another tournament and the one little kid his name is Kyrie he ends up winning a game against a sighted player. And another little fella got a draw. So we were like, oh, this is amazing. So I go to the school, I meet with folks at the school and I say, we are gonna just commit either the Jacksonville Chess Club or the Florida Chess Association. We're gonna make sure that we get you guys as much help as possible. And so I turned to the parents and in Jacksonville, my Jacksonville group, Um, I've got the best parents. I mean, they are just amazing. They're so supportive of me. They're supportive of the kids. They're supportive of the program. Um, There's nothing that they wouldn't do. And so when I turned to them and said, we got to help these kids, they were like, money was just coming right out. And they're like, how do we help? Here's some money. Here's, you know, I found out that there was a Braille clock, a clock where when you press the, um, the, the, your side of the clock, You've got a headphone, a little earpiece, and it speaks to you the time that remains on your clock and your opponent's. I never knew so that. That's really cool. even though they're blind, <laughs> they still play with a clock. A sighted person sees the numerals, but the blind person hears where the clock is. So when I told one of the parents about it, one of the parents says, I want to buy a clock. And the clocks were $200. Boom. That parent just bought a clock. Then I had another parent buy a clock. Then when I went to the state championship, I told the parents, I had a town hall meeting and I told the parents, I said, we've got blind kids that are playing at the Florida School for the Deaf and the Blind. In fact, at that particular point, I had actually run the first tournament on campus, 12 blind kids in a tournament. And I told the teacher, I said, the only thing I'm worried about is this thing blowing up to being more than what we can handle. And so I turned to those parents at that meeting and said, I'd like for us to continue to help support. By the end of the week, we had raised between Florida parents and my Jacksonville parents, $2,000, which we turned around and bought them dozens of braille boards, bought them clocks, bought all the materials that they needed to be able to have a successful chess program and actually purchased U.S. chess memberships for the students so that they could play without that being an issue. Right. And so the only downside to that is when they had a reduction in workforce, that teacher, that one critical teacher was actually um, part of the furloughed group. So that group now is there without a teacher. And so I'm reaching out to people in the St. Augustine area, trying to find someone who will go back to the school uh, and help. I'd go myself. I've even thought about it, but I've moved to the Gainesville area, but I'm still thinking one day a week, I could do that to get those kids chess. It would be worth it because when I look around, around the country, I don't know of anyone who could say they ran a tournament of 12 blind kids all from the same state. And that school is about 60, 40 blind and deaf. And like I said, the only thing that I was really afraid of was it blowing up so fast that I wouldn't be able to handle it. Because anytime you do chess, if you do it just halfway right with children, it explodes. Yeah, very quick. 
<laughs> I'm always surprised when I hear folks say, well, we stopped it because we weren't having anybody interested. And I'm like, I don't know how that happens because if you make it fun and the kids get involved and the parents get behind them, it just turns into being something phenomenal. Yeah. And I've been there too, uh, up in Jacksonville when I visited. Um, the blind kids are so sweet too. They're very, very, very smart. Um, one of them asked That's me, like, right. one of them, uh, you asked me to help out one of them during the, the a game. And he asked me after the game, what did I do wrong? And I explained it to him and I was like, he can't see the board, but he completely understands everything I'm saying. These kids, yeah. they can do it. And There's... they play 100% by touch. Mm -hmm. And we've got the Braille boards. In fact, I turned around, bought a Braille board for myself and sat there and played um, blindfolded so that I could talk to the kids to let them know some of the things that I'd learned. So for instance, nights, ridiculous. Yep. Nights are so hard to figure out when you can't see the board and you can only use your fingers. Because it's not and, a straight line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So nights are really crazy. But I was doing that because I was having so much fun with those kids. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have one question in the chat here um, pertains to the SCA. How is the SCA handling tournaments during COVID? Well, you know, we had tournaments planned and we ended up losing out on them. But what I've asked uh, is that our, our vice president our vice president uh, for the FCA is in charge of our events. And so uh, I've asked them to see if we can pull off at least a woman's event and maybe a senior event mm -hmm. online, because we've gotten some experience now based upon what U.S. Chess has done and what the uh, Continental Chess Association has done. And so the blueprint has been made, uh, laid. So we're about to set up an online tournament so at least we can get in and get some 2020 activity for a championship for the seniors and for women it was one of the things that we laid out for 2020 and i was hoping we could still get to it yeah that would be excellent if we could and we also have harvey lerman in the chat here how's it going harvey so um we also have a small bit of um uh, information about harvey we actually renamed the state championship after him so, um, Kevin, maybe you can help me out with explaining how that came about. Well, you know, I, I, to me, Harvey is an absolute treasure. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just so glad that we have him. I'm 25 glad. 25 years. <laughs> yes, 25 and more. And more, and yeah. not only that, but there's certain things that happen that you don't have to worry about. Um, and you always feel good about that when you're leading an organization. And Harvey and the newsletter, it's like clockwork he stays on top of that. And so the fact that he's been supporting Florida Chess for as long as he has, um, when that suggestion came up and we ran it by the board, the board deliberated on it and it was voted and accepted to rename the, uh, the state championship from the Dinker mm -hmm. to the Lairman. And um, I mean, honestly, I can't say much more about, uh, I can't say enough about how much you have helped chess in Florida. But uh, I'm sure that the viewers would like to know, besides chess, what do you like to do? Well, it's interesting. Now that I'm retired, um, you know, I spend a lot of time working in a yard. We purchased the new home mm -hmm. here in, in the Gainesville area. It requires a lot of yard work. And so I spend a lot of time in the yard. Um, and also, my wife and I, since we've both retired, we're taking music lessons. So uh, I take piano lessons. She takes guitar lessons. And so I've been building my repertoire. I'm really good. I've got Mary Had a Little Lamb down. Great. You know, Three Blind Mice, Row, Row, Row Your Boat. My repertoire is getting deep. And this guy, <laughs> he sent us photos too of uh, his family. Everyone's swimming in the pool, having a great time. And the retired life's got to be great. <laughs> you know, retired life is great. The funny thing about it, though, is um, I really anticipated retiring and spending a lot more time studying chess, studying opening, studying end games, just breaking it down so that I could get better. Uh, and then also um, working on um, leveling up as far as my tournament director level. I now have the experience credit to test for the associate national tournament director. Uh, so I figured I would have time to do that and also get my fee day. Uh, but I'll tell you, things have been so busy Retirement life is still a very busy time, and I end up running out of day more so than I do um, accomplishing everything I thought I would have by now. So looks like it's a journey as well. So it's not a sprint. It's a really good uh, good problem to have, honestly. <laughs> it is. 
uh, you know, I will say I get in a nap every now and then. And that's, <laughs> helpful. that's helpful too. We all do, all the hard workers. Um, so we got another question here. Um, what do you believe um, the FCA will look like in about a year, um, both in terms of memberships, tournaments, et cetera? So when it comes to memberships, in the last two years, we have really grown memberships with the FCA. Um, we were down to somewhere around the high 100s, um, 160, um, at the time that we did the crossover and the website update. But um, last year, we got up to 400 people in the FCA. Of course, the strength of people joining the FCA is the fact that certain tournaments require you to be a member. Um, and so what I would say is in the future, what we'll be looking at is more events, uh, specifically those that help people gain titles. Because one of the things that I've said to the board is our brand and our niche, the thing that makes us unique uh, in the state of Florida is no one else can crown a champion for the state of Florida except the FCA. Right. And we're duly empowered to do that based upon being the affiliate for U.S. Chess. So every time we put on a tournament, it doesn't matter what the tournament is, it's a championship. And so I think that more championships, again, this year we were supposed to hit four. Next year, I believe we'll get four, and I'm hoping for four over the board. Um, but the other thing that we'll start to see is more involved, more involvement from the directors, the board of directors at the regional level. Right. And that's one of the things that I've talked to the, to the directors about. There's 13 of them, and it's broken out into four that are kind of um, the administrative directors, the president, vice president, treasurer, and the secretary, doing all the administrivia. Then there are five people who are regional directors, one for the South, which is South Florida, Boca, you know, and all of that area, one for the Northeast, one for the Northwest, mm -hmm. one for the Central, and one for the West. And those directors have not been engaging uh, with the locals like they should. And so one of the strategic initiatives for this year is to get them involved. So when you have a tournament locally, you should see someone there from the FCA to help either run it, to help be a part, or at the very least to play in it and let folks know that the FCA is available to help. Exactly. So that's a at the point of service change. The other part is we have four people who are considered at large um, directors. And those at-large directors need to play a bigger role in helping to implement activities and programs across the state of Florida. Again, the past was all a director had to do was answer an email every now and then. Since I've become the president, the pressure that I've laid on the group has been for us to get out there, shake hands, mm -hmm. meet the people, be involved, make a difference. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, we can name one right off the bat, John Haskell. He's always around doing something here in Florida. I mean, he's also won awards uh, nationally. Absolutely. John, again, Harvey's a treasure. Mm -hmm. John is a treasure and he's a star. Right. He's a star on the national stage. Everyone knows John. As much as, 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 much as John is an icon and a fixture and almost an awe-inspiring person here in Florida. When it comes to around the nation, they know him as well. He runs some of the biggest tournaments in the nation, particularly when it comes to national tournament of champion type events. Um, you know, John is kind of the, the mentor to the mentors. Yep. And so <laughs> we're, always, we're always glad to have John's input. Um, and you know, when it comes to being on the US chess committees, John is on like seven different U.S. chess committees. So he's one of those guys where he is as involved as any person could be. And he's a great representative for the state of Florida. Mm, absolutely. And uh, we have another question here in the chat. I, I mean, this is fantastic, guys. I love that you're asking questions. And Kevin is a walking encyclopedia of information here. I'm glad that this will be on YouTube for me to rewatch to make sure that I didn't miss anything. <laughs> so uh, Dewberry Jam is asking, just yesterday, or just yesterday, someone at a gas station stopped uh, stopped me when they saw my chess T-shirt I was wearing, looking for a chance to play chess. This person was an adult with ten kids of their own, and he himself was a player in middle and high school. Um, 
What's the outlook on over the board chess happening again, whether rated or meetups? And this actually bounces off on the question earlier about how it's, uh, COVID has affected us in Florida. So, yes. Well, I can tell you the outlook is good. Yes. And here's the reason why I say that <clears throat> the fact that schools are opened again has changed the dynamic for people wanting to play. And I say that because I'm getting a certain amount of activity from parents. Now that their kids are back in school, the parents are like, so if we're gonna get the world back to normal, then chess has gotta come back online too. So um, I am currently, you know, I've got parents who, who are emailing me constantly saying, in the Jacksonville area in particular, mm -hmm. what are you doing? Let's get this going. It's time to go. My kids are ready. Let's go. And I'm like, do you feel it's safe? Yes. Now, that's a great response from parents and from children. And what we do know about the disease uh, is children are less affected. So I would say from a scholastic standpoint, we will be back. In fact, we have actually um, reserved the, um, the Wyndham in Orlando for March so that we can actually put on the state scholastic championship in March over the board in Orlando. Mm -hmm. If the kids are in school, the kids can be over the board in chess. The challenge and the concern is if you're not a child, if you're in that 60 and older age group, there's different precautions and different concerns. Right. But I would say under the circumstances, we're gonna start seeing more and more over the board tournaments happening. In fact, just two weeks ago, there was one in Tampa. I know Krista Alton actually has started. She's put a limit on the number of kids that can be in it, but she's starting to host them. I also know that you know one of our new affiliates, um, Chess Club Bobby Fisher in the Miami area, they're meeting over the board and they post their photos. They've got their masks on, um, they're meeting. So it's a comfort level. Everybody's not at that comfort level. You can't go any faster than people are comfortable with. But for those that are willing to give it a shot, I would encourage you start small, go with people who you feel a level of confidence with, you know, take the proper precautions. Um, but it's time for us to start putting our toe back in that water because um, there's a level of confidence that's starting to come back to say, children are good, children are okay. Now we've got to expand it to where others are. So I think that 2021, I'm very optimistic for 2021. Yeah, same here. And the only setback is gonna be restrictions at the venues that you want to go to. Um, example, Mike Villages here in chat is also saying, the Villages, the recreation center started letting us play this week with restrictions. So yeah, definitely restrictions, the, the big one as well. Um, and Dewberry also asking, do you have any idea what the protocols will be, such as wearing masks, hand sanitizer? I mean, Personally, I think we would definitely have all that as part of the uh, protocols. Yeah, I mean, we have It depends on the size, too. What would be our protocol? We haven't actually put it in writing, but I think mm -hmm. that we would follow the guidelines of what we've seen others do. Um, there could be limits. Um, there would probably be masks. Um, you know, in fact, we actually allowed masks at our, uh, our March Scholastic Championship. Uh, and that was, you know, right as it was breaking. And so some people wore masks, some didn't. The comfort level was different then than it is now. Um, but I would say that we as a board need to define that criteria and then we would, we'd roll it out. Yep. And um, I am Yang in the chat also is saying that he's been playing in FIDE tournaments in, oh, he will be playing one in Virginia in November. So I think we have one also coming up in December in Orlando, is that true? I think there's a scholastic so, one happening. I just so I got the Chess if, Life if magazine. It's not us. There, okay. there may be something else. But I can tell you that there have been over the board norm tournaments yes. in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. So you know, Peter up there in Charlotte, I mean he's done an amazing job with that with that program. But he started having over the board tournaments. So uh, it's coming back. And again, it's a comfort level that, you know, if you're not comfortable. You know, you don't have to participate, but there are some people that are ready to go. And um, I can tell you that from the Jacksonville Chess Club standpoint, 
we are just about ready to start back on our Tuesday night program. For five solid years, we had tournaments every Tuesday night mm -hmm. uh, in Jacksonville. And we ended up getting to the point of where we were regularly pulling about 30 players every Tuesday uh, over the board. And we had it broken into two sections, adult or actually stronger players and then um, children. But I get the emails from the parents who are like, so Kevin, what are we doing? Hello, McFly, <laughs> McFly, <laughs> they're ready to go. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you so much so far with uh, all this information. I'm having trouble keeping up, honestly. Um, but guys, this. Doing fine? <laughs> thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> um definitely the chat is blowing up as well it's hard to keep up but uh this is the segment called psychology of chess competition um i do want to have a couple of questions for kevin specifically about um his personal students who have gone to tournaments um mm -hmm. have you ever had a student who was doing quite well and maybe had some uh, difficulties in the tournament and kind of turned them off to chess and yeah, how we've seen that happen yeah, sometimes kids, you know, particularly, you know, if, I mean, look, it's personal. Every loss in chess and every victory in chess is personal. It's personal when you win because they get up and they start flossing on you. Yeah. You know, it's personal <laughs> when they lose because they'll sit there at the board and cry. You know, so, yes, I've had players who, if they didn't get a level of success, they don't feel as good about it. But I'm going to tell you, the thing that makes the difference is, in my experience, is when the group becomes a bit of like a team. Now it's hard to be a team in chess, particularly when it's not a school, but when kids are encouraging other kids and then parents are there and parents have confidence in what the, the coaches are doing and the other parents, this just, it becomes kind of chess family. Hmm. And to some extent, we started seeing people who were traveling, even if they weren't having their best tournaments, they just enjoyed being with chess family and so we had a tremendous camaraderie and i mean look when we went to the last last national tournament we had 27 kids from jacksonville that's amazing and out of that 27 40 percent of them were girls and that's another thing that we've loved in jacksonville i actually started a girls tournament there called queen's cup and we watched that grow from seven girls the first year to a high of almost 50 girls. That's and, amazing. Uh, the other thing that was really cool about it was moms, I opened up a mom section and moms started playing. Now, let me tell you, those moms are cutthroat. They were playing <laughs> pretty tough. But the cute thing about it was while the moms were in the room and their daughters were playing, the daughters would swing by and kind of look over their board. You know, that look like, eh, it's not looking so good. Yep. Mom. You know? <laughs> and then- How did you even get that? Why is the kings about? touching each other? <laughs> yeah. And so what I didn't realize was this ended up turning into as much a mother daughter event mm -hmm. as it was, you know, a chess event. And the funny thing about it is when you run a girls tournament, it's very different than boys between rounds, boys are slamming out blitz and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Girls are talking, they're eating, they're getting to know each other. They're having a great time. I've loved having the girls tournament. So it's really a great thing. You know, I, I want to mention as a coach as well, it is a very different dynamic when you're teaching a male versus a female. Um, I have a female student from Gainesville, not going to mention names, um, but Kevin knows who I'm talking about. And uh, when I started with her, she, uh, the parents told me that when she goes to tournaments, she would have shake shakes, um, maybe have to go to the bathroom to you know, relieve, throw up. Yep. So um, after working with her for a year, um, it, was rec it was asked of, of her to go to a tournament out of state for a team tournament, but my personal thought was, if she goes now, the chess might break her. She has to be approached in a very calm, um, soothing manner in order to help her get back on track. Then she went to the uh, states tournament, which is the big one. Um, she played in the U800 section K3, and she went undefeated, getting tied for second place. And she, very different uh, personality type, very calm, nice person, not like I'm gonna go ahead and smash all these pieces around, just like you were saying. You know, it's it's true. You have to you have to take each uh, student very differently. No, she was so happy. I remember, <laughs> and you were happy too. Oh, I was, was, a I was ecstatic. <laughs> you really were. I I could barely keep it in too. I had to walk out of the room for a minute. <laughs>
Um, yeah. But yeah, Dewberry also makes a good point here in the chat that kids greatly dislike online chess. I agree very, very much. And there are times um, mentioning that you cannot see their body language, gestures, facial expressions. That is all very important and are factors in a game. Um, personally, I don't want to look at a screen anymore. I want to play over the board. This last week, I went down to Miami. Um, there were four masters there, um, inc including, I remember his name, I think Oscar. He, he, he was uh, the, st the star of the Miami chess team. And they just made a movie out of it. Uh, Critical Thinking. Oh, okay, Critical Thinking. Yeah, I forgot the name. If someone can help me in the chat, I, I'm sorry if I forgot his name. But uh, anyway, going there, and I, I could not believe the shakes I had. I was so nervous to play over the board again. And it completely yeah. threw me off. So, yeah, it's, it's important to get back to over the board chess. I, I agree with you, Dewberry. And I've had cries too. I'm 27. Uh, Gamerboy990, he says, he had the pleasure of attending Mr. Pryor's events in the past. Very good seeing you again. He has a question, though. Um, he's teaching a nine-year-old how to effectively... Oh, wait, let me rephrase it to grammar. I have a question. I'm teaching a nine-year-old how to... Wait, I'm having trouble reading this. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm teaching a nine-year-old. How do you effectively teach him without boring him? All right. Well, I think the important thing is you, you need to show them how much you love the game. Yes. And then the other part, too, is break the game down into bite-sized pieces so that they get some comfort with what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, I've, I've, I've worked with a few folks, like, for instance, this one guy in Jacksonville, um, his name is Eladio. Eladio can get any kid playing chess in about five minutes because he's got a simplified game that he starts them with. So I think the most important thing is for them to get a level of success mm -hmm. and, and enjoy what they're doing. And then they'll just keep coming back because, you know, once you win, you, you know, you release all of those, you know, endorphins and dopamine. And, you know, so you just get all excited about it. And then it has, it takes on its own addictive quality. But if you're the teacher and you're just trashing them because you, you know, you're just keeping it real <laughs> against, you know, some little kid, uh, they're not going to enjoy it. So um, I, I always find when I teach my class, I try to keep it entertaining and I have fun and I challenge them, but I also want to make sure that they feel good about what they're doing. I completely agree with that. Absolutely. I mean, you don't want to put them down right away. Like for making a mistake, you have to show them, you know, okay, you made a mistake. You can just learn from it and keep it simple. Um, always keep it simple. You don't need to go complicated, pull up the hardest tactic in the world and try to explain it. It's not, it'll actually turn them off even more. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Um, excellent. So we have a special game here also from Kevin Pryor, who has graciously sent it to me. Uh, we, uh, in psychology of competition, I would like to know about what has gone through your mind through, uh, through the game here. Uh, he played this online, so he didn't get a chance to see his opponent. But no. honestly, guys, this was a really good game. Um, wh uh, what is your rating right now, Kevin? Um, 17, 1750 online. 1750 online. That is ridiculous. I think that's higher than my chess.com. Well, here's the <laughs> funny thing. I don't get to play because I'm always doing, the ch doing chess, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that's why I say they're chess players and chess doers. Yep. I'm clearly more of a doer than a player. I dream of being a player. Mm -hmm. There's just so much that needs to be done that I put my chess playing on the back burner. And I think that if you're on the board, you know, trying to deliver chess to a larger audience, your focus should be on doing over playing. So I live that. I walk yeah. that. And it's hard to find that balance. Brian's been giving me a lot of work too in the background and I want to focus on my chess, but there's there's sometimes no time, especially when chess is your is your living and you're always looking at the board. Sometimes you just don't want to look at it anymore. <laughs> it's kind of tough. Well this this particular game was hmm. a online one move at a time game. And so one of the things that I'd set up was to start learning different openings because I've always been more of a in-game focused person instead of an opening uh, in-game and then positional. It's kind of been the thing that I've tried to work on the most, but mm -hmm. openings, I don't know very well. So this one, I was uh, glad when the person opened with the French. All right. I don't know the French. 
So it caused me to go back and look and study and understand the fringe. So right. this is one of those games. So all right, so go ahead and uh, play a move on the board real quick. Make sure that it comes up in real time for me. All right, so there, there we go. go. Perfect. All right. So I had white. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this as far as talking about my game. This is awesome. The person, awesome. Was, um, the person was rated very close to me. At the time um, that we started this, the person was rated higher than me. He was uh, a higher 1,700. Um, mm -hmm. And so... Um, I'm a E4 player and all my students, they're laughing right now because they know I'm all about E4 and all about King's Gambit. Mm -hmm. So when he opened up with the French, I was like, oh, this is the French. I don't know what to do. Oui. So I actually had to try to go and try to study up to learn more about the French. So when you're doing one game a day, that helps you to be able to learn something about it. So mm -hmm. I just responded by trying to take control in the center. And then he did the typical French move Yep, <laughs> um, I took which, you know, there's, there's so many different ways that you can do it. He took it back. <laughs> and then I, you know, I always tell my kids, you know, you have to develop the uh, your, your pieces. So knights before bishops is a good general rule. Everyone knows that. <clears throat> he followed suit. And I also got my bishop off the back row so I could be prepared for castling. <clears throat> He's prepared equally. And I bring the queen out just to kind of harass him a little bit and to see what is he going to do? Is he going to put his bishop in a position where he's going to be less effective, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, let's see what he's going to do. And he brings his queen out. So I'm like, okay, then I guess it's going to be queen for queen. And a little bit that I learned about the French is it's boring. <laughs> yes, very much. And it also leads mostly to draws. Specifically so the like, exchange French, Kevin, and you're the one who initiated it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, let's so go ahead. <laughs> I go and I take. And I'm thinking, okay, so now all I have to do is just hold on, play safe, and I'll get a draw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've already made a move the same piece twice, which is excellent. Okay, that's right. So I bring the bishop out and attack a, uh, a, a, a critical square because it's not defended. That's one of the things that I teach my kids. You know, I'm not that strong a player, but the thing that I teach my kids are just good fundamentals to look for critical squares, squares that are not defended that you can attack because they have to respond. Mm -hmm. And then you are dictating the, the tempo, the initiative. So right. I just try to follow the advice I gave my kids. By the way, Kevin, so you are doing forward. perfect right now. I love it. Yep. And then I bring this out because my history is normally they come out and attack that, that night and I didn't want to lose my pawn structure. Yes. And so I'm thinking, okay, if I can keep him off of that square, We'll see what uh, way to go, what goes there. So he castles. I bring out my knight because I want to get that knight open so I have the option of going either way on castling. Mm -hmm. He creates the discovered check threat, and I need to respond to that. Um, and so I castle long. Um, and then he starts pushing pawns out, which I thought, okay, so he's going to try to pawn storm me. So it's a matter of whose pawns are faster. Exactly. So <laughs> I'm thinking, all right, so let's see where this goes. And I decide that I'm going to go ahead and uh, put some pressure uh, up the, uh, up the uh, e-file. And that's because I've got a book that's, um, that's about chess positions. And it talks a lot about um, taking... Um, control of files with rooks. And it's something that I also teach my kids that um, once you identify a file, you need to have your rook fight for the file, fight for the file, and just be willing to fight it out and win it. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, I'm going to fight for this file. So right now, my kids are like, yes, this is exactly what he tells us to do. <laughs> All right. So he develops and gets that piece off the back row. He's certainly practicing what he now, preaches. <laughs> I'm going to put additional pressure. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was saying so you, you absolutely. Oh, yeah. Did you hear me? Yes. If okay, he's going to cool. make moves, that's going to give me time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and put more pressure on that, on that Bishop and take better control of that square. Mm -hmm. He slips out to the side and now it's like, okay, we've got this exchange here. This is interesting. Um, um, I'm thinking I'm not going to sweat him coming and getting the, the night. I'm just going to go ahead and stick with the plan. Um, he then pushes a pawn, which surprised me. I expected him to come and get the, uh, get the, get the knight, but he did. Mm -hmm. 
I pushed back thinking he doesn't have a whole lot of places to go now with that bishop. And one of the other things that comes out of that book is to start finding ways to get pieces to be of less value um, than they really are. So a bishop that's following up around pawns is basically a tall pawn and he's not getting the full effect of the three. So I'm thinking he's not doing so good on that diagonal and that's to my advantage. So he comes in, takes and takes, and now, hey, I own the file. So I'm okay with that. He slides back, which I think is interesting mm -hmm. um, because he's losing space. When I looked at this using the engine, for the most part throughout this game, uh, I got up as much as two points, but we kind of stayed even for the most part. And it's basically because I don't do that great of a job. <laughs> and so- um, I You're pretty still, steady this one. I'm still staying in there, still mm -hmm. kind of even, but I think I've got an advantage because I've got control of the e-file. Um, now I'm thinking it's time for me to start pushing that, that knight out of the way <laughs> and start putting pressure uh, on the king side. He makes a move out here and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking I need to continue to push pieces forward. That bishop is sitting there um, and maybe I can attack the bishop. I like bishops overnight, so exchanging would be good for me. But there is something that I recently learned by watching uh, Brian Tillis talk about knights. And he said that you, it's hard to have tactics unless you keep a knight in the game. So I was thinking, okay, I'll try to keep my knight in the game. But if I get a chance to pinch the bishop, mm -hmm. I'll do that. Plus, his black bishop is not very effective. So um, I'm thinking I'm still in pretty good shape. So he drops him back. How's it going, Bowman? Back. Thank you for coming. <laughs> that. He pushes again with the pawn. I push. So one of the things I learned from the very first chess book I had, which was called Larry Evans from Beginner to Expert, um, says when they attack a piece, attack a piece of higher value. So I'm implementing that strategy there. I fully expect him to come and attack my bishop, which he does. So I drop my bishop back here because now his knight is trapped against the side of the board. And so he's now playing down a piece. And I'm thinking, that's how I should be playing this game. Oh, yeah. So he tries to make a space for his dark squared bishop to have some life, but it wouldn't have much life there. I then say, okay, hey, you want that? Let's go after that square. <laughs> he pushes against my bishop. I drop back. He pushes again. Now, this is where I'm doing like certain knight maneuvers because I've got my eye on that pawn that's on D5 because I'm thinking it's unprotected and he would have to respond. Yes. <clears throat> he takes, I take back. I'm a little concerned now about that open B file, especially since I've lost full control of the E file with my rook. Mm -hmm. oh, he drops back. May I make a mention real quick? Forward. Yes. Uh, sure. Uh, in the chat, you have... Agram and Anya watching you right now. They're, so those they're are loving two, and enjoying those this. Are two of my kids. <laughs> um, yeah, Agram and Anya. Mm -hmm. yeah, there you go. And by the way, Anya can win a game by just batting her eyelashes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> she, she is awesome. <laughs> All right. So I continue on. He attacks. I drop back because I still want to keep that bishop controlling that knight that's on the rim. He attacks, I move out of the way, that's fine, because mm -hmm. the king is actually in a little safer position here. He's trying to get that knight uh, rook into the game. I'm dropping back, I'm losing ground, so I'm not happy about this, but I start to redeploy the rook so that I could take control of the B file. Mm -hmm. He brings his rook out, I take control of the B file. Now, according to the engines, I'm supposed to go right after the king, but I really didn't see that. So I start jockeying around and attacking again, back to that E5. And he makes a move where he doesn't defend it. So bam, thank you very much. Uh-oh. <laughs> now you got and a then, super passer. His next move is to jump out and I see the tactic. So thank you, Brian Tillis, because he said that uh, it was a famous chess player that says, without knights, there are no tactics. <laughs> bam. Fork and he resigns. And GG on that. And that is an excellent end here to go ahead and bounce off of everyone's comments, especially in the past couple of streams. Um, 
with uh, the, they've been like mini lessons with the masters that have been on here lately, um, including Jan, uh, Martin, uh, also Mark Bernacki, and and others. Of course, we have women, Vlada Vladlina from down in Miami as well. So it was great to see that you pretty much use every single concept in those mini lessons on your on your game here. That was excellent. Oh, I'm glad to excellent hear that. play. <laughs> And I, I wanted to mention also, like, look how strong this bishop is. Like, there's no way he was ever going to grab that b-file anyway, just because of just... Ouch. <laughs> yeah. And we got a raid here from C. Watt, a party of eight. Thank you so much for the raid. So Kevin is not... Um, he doesn't understand Twitch too well, but what a raid is, is they sent their viewers as they were heading off to our stream to go ahead and support us. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah, because, you know, when I, I bought a sub and I'm like, so was that a sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so sorry, guys. I forgot to switch over to the big board. Now the big board is up on screen. I know there's like a tiny board on the top. I forgot to click that button. But uh, I'll go ahead and play through the moves just one more time as, um, as Kevin will go ahead and give us some final words here. Thank you so much again, Kevin, for joining us tonight. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I love what you guys are doing. And again, I just want to continue to build this up and get more and more people on it. It's a great conduit. You know, it's one of the things that's been missing for, for, for with chess in Florida is a way to just connect and create a sense of community. The FCA, we're spread out. And Florida is a big state. We are one of the fastest growing states in the country. We're the third largest state. And from what I understand, we gain a thousand residents a day in Florida. So it's growing really fast. That means our chests fast uh, should be growing. And I feel that pressure um, to try to make chests bigger and better in Florida. I think we have the, the opportunity to be the absolute best uh, state affiliate in US chess. And that's one of the things that I'm committed to. And as long as I have the board and the parents and the players and, and just the well-wishers behind us in Florida, we're really gonna continue to do some good stuff. So I know how things may have been in the past with the FCA, but trust me, we're making strides to make the FCA a very high functioning organization. <laughs> um, and one of the best ways to do that is by having more tournaments, because as I like to say, our tagline should be, we crown champions. Absolutely. And we really do. We have some great, strong players here in Florida, and all of which I'm sure are super hungry to get back into Overwatch, which I cannot wait to see. Um, we're getting a bunch, a bunch in the chat here. Lots of thank yous to you, Kevin, from Dewberry GM. Thanks, Coach Kevin, and thanks, Florida Chess Live, for hosting. Mike Villages also quoting how many, how many people we have in Florida. 21, almost 22 million people. Wow. Incredible. Uh, Aubrey also saying thanks for chess for hosting and coach Kevin. It was great. Everyone loved you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome guys. Well, anyway, thank you guys so much again. I loved having Kevin here. He can, he can just talk and talk. And that's why I love that this is going to be saved on YouTube. Go ahead and check out the YouTube channel on Palm beach chess. Um, we are hosting the, um, all the interviews on there, all the past ones as well. Interview Thursday. And, uh, one more thing here we have, we truly, yeah, sweet. Beta Jax also says, "Be truly missing over the board. Florida chess rocks with a coach like you, just like you, oh, Kevin." All right, <laughs> all right, guys. All right. Have a wonderful night. Um, thank you again, Kevin. And let's go ahead and send a raid right back out. I'm so sorry to um, I'm so sorry to see what for your uh. It's not a wasted raid because we're gonna definitely raid somebody else who. Definitely requires the support in chess. So let me go ahead and check that out right now. And one person in particular, I really like him. Let's go ahead and rate him. He is a uh, a kid who is a 1900 on chess.com, currently with 250 zero. Let's go ahead and rate this guy, give him some support, and go ahead and let him know that we are Florida chess, guys. Have a wonderful night. All right. Thank you again. We're still technically online, Kevin, but we will be offline in about six seconds. <laughs> awesome.
thing. 